Good evening, comrades. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're taking a look at Norman Finkelstein's uh, seminal book, The Holocaust Industry, which was first published in the year 2000, but it is very pertinent and very much up to date uh, still today and plays a huge role. And I recommend that comrades read it. It is really good at explaining um, how the Holocaust um, came to be a particular industry with is in Israel, but also pursued by the American uh, government. So unfortunately, we couldn't get Comrade Finkelstein himself. He's spoken in a number of sessions that we were involved in in the past, but he is understandably extremely busy at the moment. He's running his own channel and has got meetings coming out of his ears. So, um, But we have the second best possible speaker on this issue, which is our own Ian Spencer, who's reread the book and um, secondary literature around it. So thank you very much, uh, Ian, for preparing that. It is a hugely uh, important book, isn't it? It's still very much up to date for, for today's situation. It, it, it is, and and it's been updated by Norman Finkelstein as well. And, of course, uh, his, uh, if you want to sit, hear him in person, uh, he's also widely available on YouTube, his lectures to the Communist University and a number of other uh, fora. Uh, are all available on YouTube as well. So um, if you want to follow up, listening to Norman, Fink Norman Finkelstein himself, um, that that that's available there. Uh, I've also added a couple of other little things that I think are important about the development of Norman Finkelstein's thesis. Uh, well, so without further ado, it was interesting today uh, on Al Jazeera to see coverage of... Um, South Africa's case against Israel, uh, accusing Israel of genocide against the Palestinian people, particularly in Gaza, but also, of course, on the West Bank as well. Um, as part of that, uh, before there was a, a recording of an Israeli spokesman, uh, I didn't write his whole name down, I just remember it was Gilead someone, and um, his denunciation of South Africa, apart from denounce, denouncing it as as as, as anti-Semitism, apart from that, he was made direct reference to the Holocaust and the fact that um, how dare uh, South Africa bring this charge against Israel, which had been instrumental in establishing um, the legal basis on which something is regarded as genocide in the first place, and uh, of course. Uh, South Africa has been vehement in its uh, support in, you know, for for the Palestinian people uh, since the end of the apartheid regime, and of course, it, it, Israel stands accused not merely of genocide, not merely of genocide, uh, but also, of course, of uh, apartheid and uh, of ethnic cleansing, um, and. With that in mind, it's, it's well worth reading Norman Finkelstein's book, uh, The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering. It's a fascinating book for all sorts of reasons, and it's very readable, a very enjoyable read, uh, insofar as anything like that can be enjoyable. But it's um, it, it's very well written. It's, in many respects, a, a, a book of two halves. The first part is a consideration of the way in which the Holocaust has been appropriated as a means of uh, the continuing justification of the actions of the state of Israel against the Palestinian people. And the other part is the way in which, uh, again, uh, the Holocaust has been used to extort money effectively from Germany, Switzerland, um, but not necessarily in the interests of Holocaust survivors. And I'll come more onto that later. Uh, but in largely in in the interests of promulgating uh, Zionism as the only possible solution for the Jewish population of the world, uh, in support, so in support of the state of Israel. Um, so uh, this is Norman Finkelstein. If no one knows him, uh, born in New York City in uh, 1953. <clears throat> Both his parents uh, were from Poland and. Uh, survived the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, his mother, uh, after the Warsaw Ghetto was suppressed, was sent to Majdanek um, concentration camp and his father uh, to Auschwitz. 
Um, his father uh, was in receipt of a pension uh, from the German government for the rest of his life for um, ill health and injuries sustained as a slave worker in Auschwitz. Um, it, it's interesting to reflect on uh, Finkelstein's uh, political background, as it were. Uh, if you read the book, you don't really get a sense of this is somebody who's writing from a Marxist perspective. He is he's writing largely from the perspective of being a historian who specialises, if anything, in um, taking apart the methodology of other historians, other writers. Um, it's an interesting uh, observation he makes about uh, the existence of, 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 of writings about the Holocaust in general. And with a few exceptions, he describes most of them uh, using the excellent Yiddish word schlock, uh, which is you know, slag, clinker, dross. Um, and uh, but but his his political background, whilst it has obviously driven his studies forward, isn't doesn't come across in a tendentious way in his work. Although uh, having said that, he uh, it, it is by nature polemical. Um, so his his parents were both supporters in a qualified way of the USSR. They they were grateful to the USSR for having defeated fascism, um, and in a sense also supported the fact that the USSR uh, gave recognition to Israel on its foundation, but was subsequently extremely um, uh, critical uh, of the state of Israel and particularly the way in which it treated the, the Palestinian people. Um, neither of his parents ever once considered emigrating to Israel. Um, Finkelstein himself, um, really radicalised by the Vietnam War, became a Maoist, uh, and he worked part-time as a social worker in New York whilst he was undertaking his academic studies and eventually gaining, as it were, a, a tenure-track uh, appointment um, at, uh, at an American university, but was eventually denied uh, tenure in, in no small part because of his book, The Holocaust Industry. Norman Finkelstein taught English in Palestine at Hebron and Betzahoa, he was um, a guest of, uh, of, of of Palestinian families who, who he lived with, and they, they never once, uh, he says, um, never once um, regarded it even remotely important that the fact that he was Jewish. Uh, there was no animosity to him as a as a as a as a visiting Jewish teacher of uh, of the English language. Um, his. Uh, Education here, so he did his first degree at Brickhampton University in 1974, uh, and he did his PhD at Princeton University on Zionism, and in particular, um, the way in which Zionism had influenced um, historiography. Um, his original kind of specialism was was uh, was, was in aspects of, of, of French politics, but he's subsequently focused largely on um, on on the Holocaust. In 1982, he was uh, his first kind of action in in uh, supporting um, the, the the Palestinian resistance, as it were, was uh, protesting against the Israeli invasion of uh, of Lebanon. And in 2000, he published the Holocaust Industry. Uh, he has subsequently uh, been revised with additional chapters, particularly uh, on the way in which money was extracted from the Swiss banks. He was, and as a direct consequence of um, his his uh, well, the Holocaust industry was reviewed tenure by DePaul University, and was banned from entering Israel uh, in in two thousand and eight. In fact, he was detained at the airport and then deported uh, on the basis of his work. Uh, he's written a number of other works, including Gaza and inquest an inquest into its martyrdom. Um, he has himself been um, academically supported by Noam Chomsky who he read uh, well after he broke with um maoism he regards himself as a what he calls an old-fashioned communist or a, an old-fashioned marxist um and uh, he was supported in his work by noam chomsky and raul hilberg who i'll come on to in a moment and obviously i am and um, is of course fascinating because he was a uh 
an Arab Jew uh, born in Baghdad to a relatively wealthy family. And it's an interesting feature that Avi Shlaim talks about as well. His books are fascinating because um, his experience, of course, was that with the creation of the State of Israel, Jews who had lived throughout the Middle East uh, for centuries uh, now found themselves uh, being attacked. Uh, from that point of view, the existence of State of Israel has done a lot to exacerbate uh, anti-Semitism uh, rather than provide a refuge for it. Um, so this uh, little cartoon I couldn't resist putting in uh, Norman says, if Hamas blows up a bus as it used to do in Tel Aviv and then says, we intended to destroy the vehicle, not the passengers, people would laugh. But how different is it if Israel had dropped a one-ton bomb on a densely populated neighbourhood in Gaza as it did in July 2002 and then said, oh, we didn't intend to kill the civilians, we just intended to kill a Palestinian terrorist. And of course, that's exactly what we see happening in Gaza at the moment, uh, whole areas uh, being laid waste to. Uh, One percent of the entire population of Gaza has already been killed, and uh, it, it, almost all of its population uh, rendered homeless. The book then, um, the first part of the book uh, makes the uh, an interesting point. We tend to think of study of of uh, of the Nazi Holocaust as 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 been around for some time. Uh, what uh, Norman Finkelstein points out is that before 1961, there was really very little interest whatsoever. Uh, he grew up in a Jewish neighbourhood. He, I mean, uh, he, his parents were not religious Jews. He was not religious, um, but nevertheless, he, he grew up in, uh, in 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 religious communities. Uh, in Jewish communities, uh, but there was very little uh, interest taken in uh, the Holocaust, uh, particularly before 1961. Um, and then when looking at the reasons why, uh, there are a number of factors he, he uh, identifies. Uh, firstly, uh, that now Germany was uh, the most important ally that NATO and the, the USA in particular had uh, in the Cold War, um, Germany, of course, having been divided. Um, and what was important here was the Cold War and not any dragging up anything about the uh, about the Holocaust. The, the, in, any kind of mention of the Holocaust was something as seen as, uh, as being a, a left-wing preoccupation. Uh, he points out that left-wing Jewish activists uh, talked about the Holocaust uh, almost nobody in what he regards as the Jewish establishment in the USA uh, regarded as important. Now, it, one of the criticisms often leveled at Norman Finkelstein is that um, he effectively says things which, coming from somebody who was not Jewish, might be regarded as anti-Semitic, namely the idea of there being a Jewish establishment which has uh, power in the context of the United States and beyond. The point he's making, really, is that the... Um, the, the Jewish population in the United States uh, is not completely homogenous, uh, and and uh, and where where you have uh, a, a population which is established, uh, assimilating and attaining some kind of political influence, uh, uh, the, 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 this group of people uh, did not want at all to be associated with the left wing radicalism, which was a, a feature of many Jewish uh, communities in the period immediately before and after the Second World War. Uh, remember that before the Second World War, um, the amount of interest in Zionism uh, was regarded as, it was a very small proportion of the total number of, uh, of Jewish people who were politically active. And more importantly, uh, they were regarded as really kind of odd uh, if uh, Jewish proletarians were involved in anything, they would be involved in socialist or communist politics, or they would be, uh, or, or in the, um, the the Jewish Workers Bund. Uh, they certainly weren't in, even remotely interested in uh, emigrating to Palestine. If they wanted to emigrate to anywhere, it would have been the United States. But, but of course, uh, the coming into power of the Nazis uh, changed a lot of that. And of course, as we know. Um, the Nazis themselves were far more tolerant of 
uh, Zionist organizations than they were of uh, of, of socialist ones, uh, with with Jews, with, whether they had a Jewish membership or not. So uh, the, the Nazis would have been um, extremely hostile to the Bund, uh, but but much more lenient with regard to uh, Zionist organizations. And so the other point about this, of course, is that um, in the period after the Second World War in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, it was a, a, a almost febrile uh, uh, atmosphere of anti-communism. And we kind of think of the McCarthyite period uh, in, in which, uh, and it's a very interesting uh, study of uh, of how McCarthyism was tied up with, a, with an implicit um, anti-Semitism in the sense of associating uh, Jews with radicalism, Jews with um, a, a divided loyalty, uh, again, a, a common theme uh, in, in looking at anti-Semitic uh, uh, um, approaches to, to Jewish populations. So the Jews were associated with the left, and the last thing that the kind of more prosperous, assimilated Jews wanted to be concerned with, with associated with, was the left. Um, so you didn't really see any kind of mention of uh, the Holocaust, uh, and really until the 1967 war. Um, uh, 1956, of course, uh, was the Suez crisis. And in, in a sense, the, the first uh, um, example of, of where Israel played a role in um, f furthering a, a wider imperialist interest within the region. Uh, so 1956, uh, Israel uh, attacks Egypt, and on the basis of that, um, uh, Britain and France intervene uh, to seize control of the Suez Canal uh, in an effort to protect the imperialist interests of uh, both Britain and France, but also, of course, uh, it was Britain and French uh, shareholders who owned uh, the Suez Canal, uh, and uh, Nasser's attempt to nationalise it threatened those business interests. Uh, later on, there'll be a whole series. There'll be a whole um, session on, uh, if you like, um, uh, secular Arab nationalism uh, and the role, in particular, of Nasser. Um, so, in the meantime, uh, so with uh, 1957, uh, sorry, 1956, with uh, with the Suez crisis, um, the American president wasn't prepared to. Uh, support Israel completely, and Israel, Britain, and France were forced into a humiliating climb down. The argument is that Eisenhower was interested in um, not just uh, the establishment of a Jewish state in, in Israel, but he was also balancing that against uh, the interests of oil producing countries in the region. Uh, he was uh, interest, his interests were in, in making sure they, they, re, they retained good relations with Jordan, with, Is with Egypt and with Syria. Um, at, at, at the time, there was a real fear that uh, uh, the Israeli incursion into Egypt might damage US relations with regard to these oil producing countries. Um, so what we see in uh, Finkelstein's book is uh, a, a he documents the way in which um, the Holocaust industry became important only after uh, Israel had become an important part of U.S. Uh, foreign policy in the Middle East, uh, U.S. foreign policy, which saw the protection of the Suez Canal and uh, of oil interests in the, in the region. And that the Holocaust has ever since been used to justify the actions of the state of Israel. Uh, so, um, Reading um, Elon Pape's book, uh, the social, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Um, it was interesting to read that even in 1947, 1948, uh, Ben Gurion was using the idea that this was going to be another Holocaust to wipe out the Jews uh, as the justification for the displacement of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and the killing of tens of thousands of Palestinians in the first Nakba. Um, Finkelstein goes on uh, really to argue that the total numbers of survivors of the Holocaust has been inflated. He argues that uh, if you look at reputable historians um, of the Holocaust, um, the, the numbers of people who actually survived 
the the ghettos and the camps was about a hundred thousand in in nineteen forty five, and certainly by the time he had written his book, he he was suggesting that there couldn't have been more than about a quarter of those still surviving. Um, and the, um, one of the reasons for the inf uh, for the numbers of uh, survivors being inflated was the, the need to extort money effectively uh, from. Uh, the banks in Switzerland and the German government, uh, whilst at the same time ignoring this, this very similar culpability that existed among in US banks. So the argument is, that, for example, uh, that many uh, pe people who had uh, suffered in, in the Holocaust had uh, lodged uh, money in banks that they couldn't then subsequently get at. Uh, and the same is true in the United States, but, but that has been com conveniently ignored. Um, I just want to mention uh, Raoul Hilberg, um, because Norman Finkelstein mentions Raoul Hilberg as, uh, uh, as the, the, the most reliable, the most scholarly uh, authority on uh, the Holocaust. Um, his book is expensive if you buy the three volumes. It, the, I, the one I looked at was about 265 quid on Amazon. I did contemplate getting it. You can actually read um, uh, a one volume version online um if you go to raul hilberg's entry into wikipedia uh, in the reference section there is a link uh, which takes you through and you can read the it's it's about 400 pages the single volume and that's i think largely based on his uh, doctoral thesis so raul hilberg was born in vienna uh, in a polish speaking uh, jewish family and fled Austria in 1939. His father uh, had been arrested in uh, 1938 when the Nazis uh, invaded uh, Austria. Um, uh, because his father had been a distinguished First World War veteran, he was released and that gave them enough time to get out and eventually they settled in New York. Um, Raoul Hilberg um, uh, served in the US Army from 1944 to 1946 before going on to do his master's degree and then PhD at Columbia University. And his doctoral thesis, The Destruction of the European Jews, um, had, he had the greatest difficulty of getting it published. And, and I brought in Raoul Hilberg here because, uh, firstly, because Norman Finkelstein um, refers to him and uh, Raoul Hilberg has also been very, very supportive of Norman Finkelstein's approach. Uh, Raoul Hilberg uh, dedicated his entire life to investigating uh, the destruction of the European Jews, as it were, from a German perspective. He was interested in looking through the documents, the how uh, ordinary civil servants were uh, participating in the destruction of, uh, of European Jewry. Um, he had the greatest difficulty of getting this work published uh, for all sorts of reasons, principally because, uh, on the one hand, he... he uh, didn't really fit very well with the idea of trying to portray uh, Jewish resistance. Uh, Hilberg, for example, argues that the amount of resistance there was by Jews against the destruction uh, was really very limited. Moreover, he uh, awkwardly uh, talks about the Judenrat and uh, the fact that uh, um, in the ghettos, for example, Jewish policemen were engaged in uh, collusion effectively with the Nazis in in, in their operations. Yad Vashem, uh, the Holocaust uh, Memorial uh, uh, Library and Museum in Israel, and H Hannah Arendt uh, both opposed the publication of Paul Hilberg's work. Um, and he wasn't able really to obtain a, a, a good publisher until uh, he, he eventually expanded his, his doctoral thesis to what he wanted it to be in the first place, three volumes, uh, and published in 1985. He later taught at the University of Vermont and interestingly was awarded Germany's Order of Merit. Now, the reason why I mention Hilberg is uh, partly because of the relationship with Norman Finkelstein, but also because of the way in which... Um, any kind of attempt to depart from uh, a standardized uh, way of, um, uh, of of portraying the Holocaust, uh, it, it, it leads to ac academic suicide. Effectively, uh, you, you know, uh, just as Finkelstein was denied um, 
tenure at DePaul University, uh, Raoul Hilberg found the greatest difficulty getting his work published. And um, uh, and uh, what I also found interesting was in, in looking at this, um, Raoul Hilberg's um, supervisor was one Franz Neumann. Uh, some people may have be familiar with the book, uh, Behemoth, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Structure and Practice of National Socialism, uh, I've got a rather lovely uh, left book club edition uh, published by Victor Gollantz in 1942. Um, so Franz Neumann uh, was uh, Raoul Hilberg's PhD supervisor. Uh, uh, sadly, he was killed before the PhD was finished, uh, so it was finished off by someone else. But uh, Franz Neumann was born into a, um, a Jewish family in uh, what is now Katowice, which was part then of uh, German Silesia. Um, Neumann was a member of the SPD, um, supported the German Revolution in 1918, and in 1933 uh, escaped uh, to England and studied, studied under Harold Lasky at the London School of Economics, uh, where he published his book, uh, Behemoth, The Structure and Practice of National Socialism in 1942. Um, later, he moved to the US and worked for the Office of Strategic Services. Uh, so really, he was providing... Um, uh, uh, in, intelligence information for uh, the American government on the nature of, uh, of of German fascism, and and also he wrote some stuff on the nature of the Soviet Union as well. Um, but interestingly, he also spied for the USSR. Uh, but it's not clear that he was actually providing very much other than. Um, intelligence material of this nature so it, you know it wasn't like he was passing military secrets not that i would particularly mind if he did so in the us uh, he, he was later working for the kind of the frankfurt school of social research as it was in exile in new york before being killed in a car crash his book is well worth reading uh Behemoth, uh it's really rather like a lot of the frankfurt school stuff uh, western marxism so-called um, it's kind of a Marxism blended with Weberian sociology. So it's an interesting kind of empirical account. Uh, the interesting thing about Behemoth really is that whereas there's a tendency to see uh, national socialism, Nazism, uh, as uh, as being uh, something with a, with a kind of guiding thesis uh, outlined in Hitler's Mein Kampf, and uh, it, it, the intention was to destroy the Jews uh, from the outset, um, Franz Neumann's Behemoth uh, dissects National Socialism as, in a sense, a, almost a kind of um, uh, something which operates on the basis of expediency. Uh, there was, wasn't any original intention to liquidate the Jewish population of Europe. Uh, National Socialism responded to situations as and when. Um, and uh, the original intention, of course, was, uh, as we now know, uh, first of all, uh, that the Jewish population of Germany should emigrate and leave their property behind. Um, uh, and then later uh, was ghettoized and only later was exterminated. Um, so, <clears throat> but I mentioned Franz Neumann simply because he supervised uh, Raoul Hilberg's PhD and Raoul Hilberg's uh, uh, thesis uh, was highly influential on Norman Finkelstein. Um, so given the importance of um, Israel to US foreign policy, um, it's worth thinking a little bit about this. Here's a nice picture of Menachem Begin and Ronald Reagan. Menachem Begin was, of course, a uh, leader of the Ergun, um, whilst uh, uh, Ben-Gurion uh, was responsible for the Haganah, the, the sort of main... Um, Zionist militia uh, that carried out the original Nakba in 1947-1948, uh, 1948, displacing hundreds of thousands of Palestinian families uh, and killing tens of thousands of Palestinians uh, to uh, seize the land for Jewish settlers. Um, the, the USA uh, recognised Israel in 1947 and the USSR uh, shortly afterwards as I mentioned, um, the Suez crisis uh, of 1956 was put the, the US president in a, in a difficult position. But by the 1967 war, 
um, Israel had come to be seen as a uh, vital ally in the region, uh, particularly with the possibility that the kinds of um, Arab nationalists like Nasser, uh, who could potentially threaten um, the supply of oil uh, to the USA uh, and the West in general, um, it was it seems important as to have um, Israel on side, I and mean, particularly in the, in the in the in the context of the nineteen sixty seven war, where the where the success of the Israeli Defense Force was so overwhelming, it was seen as effectively having a a, 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 a muscular agent on the on the side of of of, of Western capitalist countries in a in in a, in a region which was potentially going to be influenced by Soviet foreign policy. Um, of course, uh, the fact that the Soviet Union had supported uh, not only the establishment of Israel, but supplied arms to the Haganah and the Urgun, um, uh, and indeed it's questionable as to whether Israel would have survived without Soviet help. Uh, it's not clear why Stalin uh, was su supporting Israel, except possibly to hedge his bets, as it were, in the hope uh, that Israel would become an, an anti-Western force, an anti-capitalist force. Certainly by the time of the 1967 war, um, certainly by the time of the 1956 uh, Suez crisis, um, relations between the USSR and Egypt were, were well established. And there was a, a, a concern with um, uh, 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 the influence in the Middle East of, uh, of, the, uh, of the USSR. Uh, the, the other point about it that... Um, uh, Norman Finkelstein makes is that with the with the victory of Israel in the 1967 war, all of a sudden um, to support Israel was not only um, a, a, a sign of um, the, it was no longer associated with the left, as it were, because Israel was now a, a central feature of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Support for Israel became an, an important part of being Jewish in the United States. And whilst, of course, um, there remained a, 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 a Jewish left, a, a progressive force within uh, uh, US politics. So, you know, we think of the civil rights movement, and the important part played by uh, Jewish activists in that. Um, nevertheless, as far as what Norman Finkelstein talks about as the Jewish establishment, support now for Israel became a... Um, almost a patriotic requirement of being a US citizen. And so instead of uh, the idea of there being this uh, d dual loyalty, firstly to, the, to, firstly to Israel and Judaism, uh, and, uh, and also then to, to, to the United States, now uh, they were united as one. Uh, to support Israel was to support the United States. And so from that point on, really, you start to see a, a, a mushrooming of the Holocaust industry. And the growth of an enormous amount of what um, Finkelstein calls schlock in terms of uh, of, of Holocaust um, product, the production of books about the Holocaust, films about the Holocaust, and so on, because it all played into an important sub theme around the support for U.S. foreign policy, um, <clears throat> and of course, even before the current war. Um, Israel was regularly receiving something in the region of $3.8 billion a year in military aid. Uh, and that's quite apart from all the other uh, assistance in terms of, for example, the United States um, underpinning uh, uh, Israel's access to, to loans and so on. Um, so the, the, the role, the interrelationship between Israel and the United States in this context is absolutely crucial and crucial, therefore, to the development of the Holocaust industry. And the Holocaust industry uh, providing this constant um, uh, justification for whatever Israel does um, as a victim of the Holocaust is, is therefore entitled to prevent that from ever happening again. And it, the, the same thing is being portrayed. In, in 1967, uh, an argument was that here it is again, the Arabs trying to carry out yet another uh, uh, Holocaust. Uh, Two thirds of uh, Norman Finkelstein's book is really about the, what he calls the shakedown of, of Germany and Switzerland in terms of the extraction of um, vast amounts of money, um, supposedly 
uh, in reparations to Holocaust survivors. But in fact, most of the money seems to have been appropriated either by the state of Israel directly or uh, through, for example, uh, Holocaust memorial uh, organizations or lawyers or people associated one way or another with the Holocaust industry. Uh, and the amount that actually got to uh, those remaining uh, Holocaust survivors uh, was 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 very little and paid very slowly. Um, so uh, Germany uh, had offered to pay reparations as early as 1952. Um, as I said, uh, Norman Finkelstein's father was in receipt of a pension from the German government. And what Finkelstein argues is the two central dogmas of the Holocaust industry is that first of all, first of all, that the Holocaust is a unique event in 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 history, um, and secondly, uh, that it was the climax really of an irrational hatred of Gentiles by Jews uh, of, of of Jews by Gentiles. Uh, the idea is, in some sense, um, that uh, this irrational hatred of Jews by Gentiles is something which is, as it were, immutable and therefore justifies the existence of the state of Israel. As I tried to argue in uh, my session on uh, the Jewish question, Karl Marx and the Jewish question, and, and, and what is anti-Semitism, where we looked at the work of, uh, of Abraham Leon, is that um, anti-Semitism has a history. It hasn't always been an eternal feature of the relationships between Gentiles and Jews. At various points in history, uh, Jews and Gentiles and Arabs and Muslims uh, have, have, have coexisted uh, for, for, for centuries. Um, and it is uh, a particular context at a particular time that where we see anti-Semitism, where you have uh, the decline of feudalism and the growth of capitalism. Um, and similarly, uh, and the reason why I mention um, Behemoth and Franz Neumann is because, um, again, anti-Semitism in the context of, uh, of Germany and German National Socialism it, it is understood in a particular way. It, it's understood as a way of um, the, 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 the importance of um, crushing any kind of possible, possible opposition uh, to, to, to capitalism in general uh, and in, in the context of uh, a national socialist Germany, uh, the Nazis were seen as agents to prevent the possibility of, a, of another uh, attempted communist revolution. And uh, uh, Franz Neumann understood it in those terms. Leon Trotsky incidentally understood it in those terms. Um, <clears throat> so rather than it being a question of uh, an irrational hatred of, of Jews by Gentiles, it, it is something which takes place in a, in a historical context. But the Holocaust industry it portrays it as this uh, deep-seated, irrational uh, hatred. Uh, the picture, by the way, is a, a, a plaque in uh, the Brandt Square in um, Warsaw, uh, um, which commemorates uh, Villebrandt's act of supplication in 1970, uh, when at the wall uh, commemorating uh, the, the the crushing of the the Warsaw uprising, Willy Brandt knelt in in supplication. Um, so Germany has effectively paid billions of dollars in compensation, um, largely to prevent the possibility of the boycott of German goods and to foster uh, trading relations uh, with Israel. And actually, Germany is now one of the most important trading partners that Israel has. And similarly, uh, in Switzerland. Um, one of the reasons why Norman Finkelstein attracted quite a lot of criticism from the left is that in a sense he, he was seen as kind of, why would you want to defend the Swiss banks? Um, the nature of what he calls the shakedown of, uh, of the Swiss banks was not dissimilar to that of Germany. Um, there were millions of marks deposited in Swiss banks by uh, Jewish victims of the Holocaust, uh, who subsequently couldn't get their money back out again. Um, what you're going to do if if you've got some money, uh, you you really want to put it in the bank of a neutral country, don't you? Uh, of course, um, Switzerland had a, a, a lamentable uh, history in terms of uh, re refusing to accept uh, uh, Jewish refugees. Except, I think there were about twenty thousand uh, managed to escape to to Switzerland. The overwhelming majority of uh, of Jews who escaped. The Nazis went eastwards uh, into the former Soviet Union. Um, uh, others, if they could get out soon enough, went to the United States or wherever else. 
um, and, and Switzerland was not exactly um, forthcoming about accepting Jewish refugees. But the, effectively, uh, uh, Norman Finkelstein argues that the, 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 the Swiss banks were uh, paid out billions of dollars in compensation, largely under pressure of boycott uh, and, uh, uh, and the World Jewish Council lawsuit against uh, the Swiss banks. Um, the point about this is, of course, uh, not that the compensation shouldn't have been paid, but the compensation didn't go to the survivors. The compensation went into the pockets of, uh, of lawyers, into the Israeli state itself, into organizations whose principal job it was, was to continue the whole business around the Holocaust industry and of arguing that the Holocaust continues to be uh, the, the justification not only for the existence of the state of Israel, but as a justification for anything that Israel chooses to do in terms of um, promulgating its interests up to and including the genocide of the Palestinians. Thank you. Wow, fascinating. Thank you very much, comrade. That was a really good uh, introduction and it's it is worthwhile reading that book i think it really explains and puts into context not just the holocaust industry but explaining how israel has been uh, the the picture of israel the the picture of what happened has changed throughout history and has been an, instrumentalized um the first person who wanted to come in is tony greenstein so i'm going to make you a panelist um if you have questions, comrade, please click raise hand and I can bring you in as panelists. You can ask a question or you can make a comment. There were a few questions in the chat. Comrades, I can't I can't follow that all because I'm also doing all the technical stuff. So please, please do come in if you if you have a question, though I do try to read some out in the QA um, if you want. Uh, and another interesting book, just quickly before Tony comes in, is um uh, Norman Finkelstein's uh, A Nation on Trial, where he takes apart gold targets. Uh, um, theses that basically all the Germans were to blame that there's uh, anti-Semitism is integral into the Germans uh, and so the whole nation was to blame there's no difference between you know communists or social democrats Jew uh, and, and and the uh, and, and those who perpetrated all these crimes anyway um, Tony has to go very soon so I'm bringing him in first and then I'll bring in other comrades hi Tony yeah hi uh Tina, uh, I'm sorry that I've got to go, but I've got an Al Jazeera interview as well, so <laughs> I'll, I'll try and get make this as short as possible. Uh, I mean, I think it's an interesting and it's a path-breaking book in many ways. However, I would not uh, say that it was a brilliant book. Uh, it's very scrappy and it's very bitty in many ways. And I also think that Norman Finkelstein got too distracted by the kind of reparations, the money shakedown and so on and so forth. Uh, and what he didn't really uh, concentrate on, indeed, he dismissed the whole question of the utilisation of memory, which he described as an ideological construct. Uh, in his book. I mean, he's right. It, well, it is an ideological construct, but it's a construct for a particular purpose, which today is uh, the justification for whatever it, Israel does. I mean, he pointed out, uh, I, mean, his, I mean, you mentioned uh, Raoul Hilberg, who was uh, unsurpassed uh, in terms of being a whole... Uh, a historian of the Holocaust, but of course, the version of uh, Holocaust history that Hilberg uh, uh, dealt with was not the one that was useful uh, to Israel in its weaponization of the memory of the Holocaust, which is incidentally, of course, what my book uh, concentrates on. It's how the Holocaust is used, I think, which is important today. Uh, I mean, Zionism starts from the basis that uh, Hitler's extermination uh, of the Jews, which, of course, happened in 1941, not at the onset of the Hitler regime in 1933, was a war against the Jews. I mean, that's the title of a book by Lucy Davidovitz uh, and Yehuda Bar, who's the chief Zionist historian 
uh, adopts that completely. And that it, it, there is a pretty much a unanimity that the Nazis were not about uh, destroying the labor movement or uh, about being anti-modern or anything else. Their sole mission was a demonic hatred of the Jews, and therefore that was uh, their really their sole concern. So the fact that Dachau, for instance, was opened as a concentration camp for socialists, communists, and trade unionists and completely passes them by, as does the extermination, for example, of uh, the Roma uh, and other people are disabled, for example. So... Uh, the Z Zionism has constructed a particular historiography and someone <coughs> like Hilberg, who, uh, as I say, even Yehuda Bard had to describe him as unsurpassed, were, did not fit in. I mean, he dismissed Jewish resistance of being uh, of little consequence. And I, I think he was right. He was also criticised for the fact that he used uh, German documents uh, as the basis of his uh, primary research. Well, of course, since the Nazis spoke German, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, what other language uh, they would expect them to have dealt with, uh, certainly not Hebrew. So <clears throat> there was all that. I mean, in, in essence, uh, the Nazis' anti-Semitism stemmed from the fact that they saw Jews as the biological parents of Bolshevism, which was their main target. Uh, and Hitler, whenever he refers to Marx, always calls him Marx the Jew. And uh, he talks about Judeo-Bolshevism in his uh, in Mein Kampf. But I, I come back really to my point that, uh, and this is about Norman Finkelstein, I think he concentrates uh, uh, and misses the point in many ways the, the great thing was not the question of the reparations. Yes, I mean, the reparations went to all sorts of Zionist educational foundations, uh, it disappeared into the pockets of lawyers. There was a massive scandal in America, the Jewish Claims Conference, which took a large part of the reparations, and uh, there was just open embezzlement and so on. Uh, whereas in Israel itself, uh, over one third of the Holocaust survivors to this day live in poverty. So, I mean, uh, the Holocaust was never about those who survived. It was never about the individuals who died. It was always about uh, how Zionism could best use it. Uh, firstly, when Hitler came to power, uh, his ascent to power was almost welcomed by the Zionist leadership. Uh, and in the wake of the Holocaust, uh, the Zionists uh, have exploited it. But it, it was after 1961 that the Holocaust became a major, uh, if you like, ideological weapon in Israel as a result of the Yeichman trial. And the Yeichman trial itself was a consequence of the Kastner trial, where a major Jewish collaborator had launched a libel uh, suit against his detractor, who had called him a collaborator only to find... Uh, that the evidence was against him. I, mean, I'm not, I, I don't have time uh, to go into it. But Finkelstein also missed out. I mean, he talked about the shakedown and the reparations. In fact, one of the major thieves of uh, Jewish property in the war was actually Israeli banks who sequestered uh, hundreds of millions of pounds. And there's still a campaign in Israel by uh, the survivors for them to release it. So... Uh, Clearly, it wasn't uh, really about uh, the justice of uh, what had happened, but uh, really about Israeli rearmament or Israeli armament. And their deal with uh, Germany was incredibly important. Germany, in essence, provided the submarines and nuclear technology and much else besides. And the payoff, of course, was Israel did not raise any objections to the integration of West Germany into the NATO uh, Atlantic Alliance. So I, I think it's a useful book, uh, of course, but I think it's very, very anecdotal and the end doesn't get on top of its subject. An equally important, possibly uh, more important book is the book from which he takes a lot of his inspiration, Peter Novick's, Novick's uh, Holocaust in the American Life, in American Life, which describes in detail uh, how the Holocaust uh, 
figured, if you like, in the life of American Jews and how it was ignored throughout the post-war uh, period, as you said, because of anti-communism. And then uh, the further away the Holocaust was, the greater uh, the greater significance it, it had. Also, I think Finkelstein concentrates or over-concentrates on the Holocaust in terms of the American Jewish establishment uh, and doesn't deal really with the way Israel itself has utilised that. And I think that's extremely clear today when Israel is characterising its attack on Gaza as a war against the Nazis, no less. I mean, that, uh, uh, there's no point in deconstructing that. It's, it's pretty obvious who the Nazis are. It isn't the Palestinians. So... Uh, I'll really leave it at that, uh, and if I can uh, re-enter this discussion, uh, I will uh, later on, depending. Excellent. Thanks, Tony. You should maybe convince um, Norman to do a third edition <laughs> with all the changes. You know? so, well, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much anyway. See you. Bye. Thank you. Um, Ian, there's a, a couple of questions I want to put you to you before I bring in some, some people from the from the floor. Um, in the Q&A, for example, uh, I'm not sure you you know that, but do you know how many copies have been sold of this? I've just tried to look it up briefly, um, but I couldn't couldn't find it. I don't, uh, it, but it's it's been very widely distributed and translated into a, a, a wide range of different languages, including German, uh, and and has sold yeah. uh, sold very well. Um, it, uh, I'm not disagreeing with Tony at all. I think you know it, it, Norman Finkelstein's book is about the, the the way in which the Holocaust has been used uh, by Zionists. It, it isn't really a um, uh, it, it isn't as detailed in, huh. in, in other areas. Um, but nevertheless, it, it. I mean, I remember as a student. Um, ha thinking trying to think myself about the way in which the holocaust was being used at the time and and actually it, it took norman finkelstein's book to to kind of crystallize that uh it, it, as a as somebody who's not jewish uh and being constantly accused of being anti-semitic um it it, it was a played a, i think a powerful role and 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 it's on that basis really that it has, has sold in very very large numbers but the precise figures i couldn't say yeah, no, I think um, Tony might be right about some of these things, but it is, as, as you say, it is a very um, easy read, <laughs> as well as being quite political and explaining very well how it has changed for various reasons. And also, which gets to the second question, which is, a, a, it, I mean, it is, you know, Tony criticized it as it's the personal, it's a bit too about his, you know, being an American Jew, etc. But I think he, he really explains really well the experience of Jews who survived the Holocaust not only was it not talked about it was seen as an embarrassment you know he says they kept it quiet his parents were embarrassed because it was seen as you did something wrong you were led to the slaughter you know it's you should be ashamed for having survived that because you know it meant that you know you didn't you didn't fight back and you know you, you, you were um so it was seen as as being embarrassment it was kept quiet, etc. Jews were wanting to make it in America and not being, uh, you know, um, being identified with, with that horrific uh, experience and just sort of move on and do it all and, you know, conquer the world, etc. So I think it's quite, it's really interesting to explain from, from that aspect how that then all of America as well got behind Israel and for, for what reasons. So I think he does, he does explain that, that experience quite well. And there's a question, a related question from Carol. Um, is it true that the Jews that died in the Holocaust were at first thought of an embarrassment by the Zionists as well, because they didn't resist as they should have? So it, in Israel as well, um, was there a similar um, aspect not to try and, you know, talk about the Holocaust too much? From what I read, yes. Uh, and uh, that the somehow they... They went like lambs to the slaughter, as it were, and and because they didn't fight back, uh, it was seen as, uh, as somehow shameful. Um, it, of course, it, it ignores the very real heroism of, for example, the, the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, the very real heroism. I mean, it was a, a, a rather um, 
chintzy sort of film uh, defiance with Daniel Craig about the uh, Bielski Otriad, uh, uh, you know, partisans. And what it ignores, of course, is that millions of Jews actually fled eastwards and joined the Red Army and joined partisan groups and the rest of it. So, in a sense, um, Raoul Hilberg may, maybe understates uh, Jewish resistance somewhat, and maybe Norman Finkelstein does a little, a little bit as well. Mm. Having said that, uh, I think it's right that there was a kind of embarrassment about the way in which it was. I, I think the other thing that Raoul Hilberg got into trouble for was um, the extent to which um, um, the, the Jewish police and the Judenrat colluded. Uh, and, um, and, and of course, some of these organisations were, were dominated by Zionists. Uh, um, and opportunities to get people out were, were, were often missed. For, the, for that very reason, that it was in, in the hands of Zionists. Mm. There was a there was a question: Why did Anna uh, Hannah Arendt in particular? Why did she uh, oppose Hilberg's publication for those reasons, or were there additional reasons? I think it was largely for that the the, the fact that he, he uh, was portraying the Jewish population as as somehow passive, that he under under understated the extent of of, of resistance. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I think largely for those kinds of reasons. Mm. Well, it was interesting as well when 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 you were talking about the um, you know the the changing nature of the Holocaust and how it was seen, how it was being used, you know, first ignored and then used, um, is also reflected quite well. I think in that famous uh, Pastor Niemöller quote, which I did an article about a little while back and researched it uh, as well, because it's that has changed quite dramatically over the decades because initially i mean he in his original he actually starts off with first they came for the communists and the trade unionists and the socialists all of that got lost in in you know when it's being retold and when you hear it today everybody knows it's a first they came for the jews or sometimes you get first they get came for the trade unionists etc but clearly it's that has also undergone a, a, a weaponization and, and a changing um, in in the popular um, memory, etc. Okay, um, a question then as well on the um, you mentioned the the uniqueness, which is of course uh, used. You know, this Jewish suffering during the Holocaust was unique, or is presented as unique. Uh, there's nothing like it before. There will never be anything like it since. As as an as a reason to not criticize Israel, I mean that is very very much uh, sort of what's happening today still, isn't it? I mean that's been going on for some time, and it's now so that means you cannot and uh, not allowed to compare to the millions killed in the slave trade, it, you know, Ireland closer to home, um, uh, Palestine now obviously is the obvious one, you know that is all it's not allowable to compare the two so the uniqueness is is a huge is a huge um importance of 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 the holocaust and how it's presented how how does um finkelstein or how does the use research how do you how do you view that that importance of the uniqueness of the the holocaust i mean it manifestly isn't unique is it i mean it's estimated that 10 million were killed in the belgian congo under mm. the whilst the Belgian Congo was the direct, wasn't even a colony of Belgium, it was the personal property of King Leopold of the Belgians, and 10 million Africans were killed in the course of, for the extraction of rubber, for example. Um, and I think, it, it, I think the, the question around uniqueness as well, it, what's often lost is um, the, the the, the fact that the Nazis associated Judaism or Jewish people with radicalism um, rather than uh, Jewishness as such, um, the you know as, you, as you've already said, you know in 1933 it's, it's it's the communists and the social democrats and the trade unionists that hauled off first, many of whom would have been Jewish, but that's incidental. They were being got they were being got rid of because they were communists and social democrats and trade unionists. Um, so, you know, in terms of uniqueness, well, you know, we, I think we also need to remember that millions of others have been slaughtered for political and 
economic reasons as well. Um, and, but the idea that somehow create creating any kind of equivalence between um, the, the the genocide of of Armenians or whatever else uh, it, it, it is is regarded as something which some, I don't see how that on earth that that, that threatens mm. Israel. Um, you know, quite mm. clearly there is nothing unique about it. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting it's point. Isn't it? Yeah, sorry. The methods are extraordinary. Mm. Well, it was an interesting point that 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 Finkelstein uh, makes is that the the it's presented like the the Jewish suffering was so unique that means that um, we need to use different methods to discuss the morality when it comes to, for example, the occupation of Gaza and the occupation mm -hmm. of the which was of course the outcome of the sixty seven war, which um, you know it's called the six day war, but it was actually over within minutes um, they were defeated. But then it carried on because they wanted to conquer the Golan Heights, the the Gaza uh, and the West Bank. And that was hugely disputed. Um, we should remember that in the UN, I mean, that that's a lot of a lot of that come comes from from then. And the UN had two sides when they one both both opposed the occupation. Both said you have to stop the occupation. Um, it's just a question of you know should Israel be recognized, etc., by the Arab states or not. But both uh, demanded that Israel stop stop the occupation. And in the context of that, to justify. That you know you can't you can't possibly um, uh, tell us to stop the occupation. Look at what we've suffered, and we you know there shouldn't be the same. You shouldn't have the same sort of moral guidelines or moral um, uh, measures when you talk about what we've gone through, what others have gone through. That's that's one reason, isn't it? Why the or the key reason why the uniqueness has been emphasized so much. Yes, and and also um, for example. Uh... The, the the fact that Hitler had meetings or Hitler's um, I think it's Ribbentrop had meetings with the Mufti uh, and you know, there was an, an, an attempt to associate any kind of um, um, Muslims in the area as somehow being um, part of part of the reason why the the, the Holocaust took place in the in, at all uh, you know object the Mufti objecting to uh, People, uh, people emigrating to Palestine was one of the reasons why the, the Nazis decided to um, set about the the so-called final solution. Um, so it's used as a, a, a rationalization for all sorts of cruel attacks on on, on the Palestinian population, uh, quite apart from anything else. Yeah, um, I'm going to bring in Virginia now, um, who has problems with her camera, so she's just going to talk. Hi, Virginia. Hi, I'm unmuted, I, I imagine. Yes. You are. Well, I sorry that I missed the first 15 minutes and I, I haven't read uh, Norman Finkelstein's book, but and I don't really have a question, but just I would agree. I grew up in New York um, and was born in the mid 40s and grew up in New York in the 50s and 60s to a completely secular Jewish family. Um, and I I would certainly agree that um, this is, issue of uh, of uh, of Israel wasn't really in the forefront of a lot of people's minds, um, and um, but, but I I would just wanted to say that um, I think that one one thing that seemed to uh, turn some people to uh, Zionism was um, the um, who were, had been communists was the uh, Khrushchev revelations of 1956, and um, I think that that um, certainly. Um, well, my father had a lot of sisters, and certainly two of them who had they that turned them to being terribly interested in Israel, whereas before they hadn't been. Um, and I also don't know I don't know whether Ian mentioned my first sort of uh, knowledge of Norman Finkelstein was this um, dispute between him and Alan Dershowitz. Was this covered in in your talk? Uh, I don't know, but um, which was absolutely vicious on Dershowitz's part and got Norman Finkelstein. Um, fired from the faculty of DePaul uh, University. Um, and uh, another thing that, that happened in, in, in the States was when Black Power and um, SNCC and, 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 you know, was, was reaching a kind of crescendo, um, a lot of Jewish activists um, 
who had been very active in the civil rights movement and freedom and things. And a lot of that, you know, kind of fell away. Um, I'm not saying that those people became Zionists or anything like that, but the sort of, um, and the, the, the dominance of, of, of uh, or the, the, the great predominance of, of Jews in, in um, that aspect of, uh, of, of American left politics uh, was um, not in the forefront so much anymore. And then of course there was the, uh, the um, hijacking, the Leila Khaled um, hijacking. I'm just, I'm just commenting that these are um, um, memories that I, I recall about, um, you know, shift in, in, in sort of interest in uh, what was going on in Israel and uh, among people that I knew or, or even didn't know very well um, in, in that period of time later on um, that hadn't been there before. That's um, all I wanted to say, thanks. Thank you, Virginia. Do you want to say anything on that, uh, Ian? I, I, I didn't go on at length about the Dershowitz uh, debate with Norman Finkelstein because I, I didn't want to um, muddy the waters, as it were. But of course, uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting illustration about how the academic world um, <coughs> is dominated by an orthodoxy, and it's an orthodoxy related to, and you can see it today. I mean, people are losing their jobs now uh, by uh, having the temerity to suggest that um, Israel is, is engaged in genocide. Um, it, 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 it's, um, the other thing I wanted to mention as well, of course, is that uh, American <coughs> Jews at the moment are actually in the forefront of Palestine solidarity. In a sense, it's rejuvenated a radicalism that existed in the Jewish population in, in the United States um, uh, and, and has been there for, for many, many decades. Uh, you know, very few Jews wanted to immigrate, emigrate to Palestine. Uh, if you if you had any sense, you'd, you'd, you'd go to the United States. So that's, that's where they would... There are more there are more Jews in New York than there are in uh, Israel. So why the hell would you want to go to Israel? Why would the hell would you want to go to Palestine? And and uh, and they took with them the, that radicalism, um, which you know, and, and the, the radicalism that you you still see in people like Noam Chomsky or whoever else. Um, and uh, one argument about uh, um. The whole kind of McCarthyite period was, of course, that it was also, as much as being anti-communist, it was ferociously anti-Semitic. Uh, not least of which because Jews were identified with 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 being on the left. And um, there's a PhD in it for somebody. If you look at the the films that were produced in the 1960s and 70s, particularly kind of um, kind of swords and sandals type dramas like The Robe and various other things, uh, and uh, uh, Bert Lancaster, I'm uh, not about Bert Lancaster, the, the other one has come to me in a minute. Um, the, the, the film about Moses and all the rest of it, you actually see a whole kind of uh, popular culture portrayal of you know, valiant Israel up against the Philistines and all sorts of things. And, and it's, it's written throughout uh, popular culture in Hollywood. And, and and by the way, of course, uh, as you well know, uh, you, you're much more likely to get thrown out of the Labour Party if you're Jewish, <laughs> especially if you're the wrong sort of Jew who, who objects to genocide being carried out in the name of Jewish people. Charlton Heston, I think. Is Charlton the... Heston, that's the one, yes. <laughs> uh, Matthew, please. Yes, uh, Charlton Heston, otherwise named for his support of the, uh, the National Rifle Association. Um, extremely right-wing man. Um, but no, I think you're, what you said is, is, is right and interesting. But I think in terms of you know, anti-Semitism, of course, I mean, the, 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 the British um, you know, government and so on you know, were, were almost equally anti-Semitic. Um, you know, the... Churchill and so on were just you know, monstrously anti-Semitic, uh, and actually, of course, Zionism is, of course, aligns itself, tries to a method of aligning itself with that with that actual anti-Semitism. And of course, you know, neither neither the British nor the Americans and so on were actually interested in rescuing anybody from the from Holocaust. They knew about it. They didn't want to do anything about it. Um, you know, as is quite quite uh, well uh, um, outlined in, in Tony's own book. 
um, which is which is very good. Um, I think um, you know what you're talking about. Also, I mean, you say well that that you've got a situation where clearly the Israelis um, and the Zionists are, you know, incredibly sensitive about about any other um, genocide conducted against anybody else. Which can even, you know, we could say, I mean, obviously there, there have been. Um, actually, I think, I mean, somebody made made the point. I can't remember that actually the direct um, progenitor of, of of the methods of the Nazis was that was the German experience in what is now Namibia, in which they did try and exterminate an entire an, an, a, 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 two peoples, I believe. Um, you know, and that it's that actually that that that, that you know if you like, bringing that, that sort of colonial imperial experience to home, you know, that's actually then used. And we, 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 we're going to, you know, we see this all the time, you know, as, uh, you know, that, that actually, of course, the methods used uh, against the, uh, the, lesser, the lesser people can then be applied to, the, to particularly, obviously, the working class at home. Um, so, right. you know, in those terms... You know, it, 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 it's actually to say, well, you know, this is a, this is a methodology that comes out of out of capitalism itself, and not you know some something peculiar uh, to 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 the, to the Jews. Um, so, uh, also in terms of, I mean, 1967 clearly is, is the turning point because obviously you get a situation where you have, you know, previous to that, um, you know, as you say. There isn't particular support. Actually, the first the first lot of people to support Israel were the Stalinists. You know, the, the USSR recognised Israel within three days of its creation, well before anybody else. And not only that, of course, they were the first to supply weapons. You know, they supplied weapons to Haganah in order to 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 to, to allow it to 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 um, set up the state of Israel. So the Stalinists again, you know, another another thing you can put down to the crimes of of, of Stalin against you know the, pe- the 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 left and the peoples of the world, um, you know. So in, in those terms, and and of course this this of course is 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 the same in terms of you look at the Labour Party. The point that's been made by numbers of people, of course, is that historically, of course, it was the left of the Labour or the technically the left, uh, you know, what you would describe as the left of the Labour Party, you know, who, who supported the Zionists. Up until about 1980, you know, the, 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 you know, people like Tony Benham so, so who supported the Zionists. And then, then of course, then once you get the growth and the thing, I think that, that, that this is critical of what's happening at the moment, of course, is that you've then had, you know, from that point onwards, you know, from, from the 70s and 80s onwards, the growth of a, of a Palestinian solidarity campaign, which has been continuous. And it's actually that, you know, you've got an existing camp. What's happening is this is what's happening now is taking place in the context of you've got an existing solidarity campaign, which has been around for decades and people have actually understand, understand something of the issue. And thus you see a much bigger response than, than, than say, you know, some, uh, you know, other, other equivalent wars, you know, uh, and, a, and a, a much clearer um, set of communications. I mean, if you look at sort of the massacres in, in uh, you know, the invasion of Iraq and so on, um, uh, and, and, and Afghanistan, I mean, very, very little established communication between those, you know, the, 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 the peoples of those countries and, and say, you know, the imperialist countries, whereas in the, Palestine, in the case of Palestinians, it, 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 it's been going on for decades. And so therefore, this is why I think this is one of the reasons why we're seeing this explosion of, 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 of uh, solidarity and why it's so embarrassing to, to the imperialists themselves uh, and actually points up the, you know, the very sort of naked uh, state of the imperialists. But the thing about 67, of course, is the war, the success in the war, you know, is, is enormous. I mean, the, the, the Israelis not only, you know, take over Gaza, the West Bank, Golan Heights, all of Sinai. I mean, the one that, the, you know, effect, the effective de facto border being the Suez Canal, you know, it's huge. And therefore, you know, obviously then you have a position in which the Americans say, well, OK, well, they're, they're, our, they're our guys, you know, we'll, we'll support them. You know, because obviously they're, they're you know they're good at this killing people, um, and and therefore they they can form this this basis of 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 uh, control of the Middle East, which has always been a problem for. Them. And therefore you get 
obviously, as people have also pointed out, Biden for the last 40 odd, 40 odd years or longer, because obviously he's been around in politics and, you know, in, in bourgeois politics for, for, for a very long time, since the middle 70s, um, saying, well, you know, we, we can't replace Israel. It's something we absolutely need in order to control this place. And, and, and paying them billions every year and giving them loads of weapons is, is cheap, you know, <laughs> because they actually form the basis of control. Um, and that, that that's that's what 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 we're what we're seeing at the moment because is that is that start to to uh, to peel apart, um, and the fact that the project is itself falling down. Now, I mean, the thing is, the other thing, of course, is that actually, I mean, while as you say, that what we're seeing is obviously a, a, a campaign in the U.S. in particular, which is led by young Jewish. Uh, activists in support of the Palestinians, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and very difficult for these guys to say, oh, you know, I mean, they try it, and this is it, this is great sort of found stuff, you know, you're anti-Semites, whereas actually, of course, they're actually Jewish. Um, I mean, you get, I mean, the ridiculous nature of the, the hearing in uh, the, the this, uh, House of Congress on the 5th of December, in which Elise, led by Elise Stefanik, who is, a, who is an actual anti-Semite, who believes in the great replacement theory, um, you know, she's an actual card carrying anti Semite, accusing people of being anti Semitic for, for, for opposing the, the, the genocide of, of, of Palestinians. It's unbelievable. Um, but there is then also another faction, of course, is that you see that there is, I mean, much of the actual settlement uh, 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 on the West Bank actually uh, is led by Americans, people with American passports. Um, so there, there is that faction in there as well. Um, uh, and 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 then it's that actually the driver that that's actually the driver of the current government. Of course, is they're in charge. Those guys are in charge. You know, they, they're maniacs. Of course. Um, so in that sense, it's actually pulling the whole thing apart. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, it it it's you know what you're saying in terms of the Holocaust. It's very it's important, but it's you know it's actually to try and go go beyond that in terms of the development, particularly obviously the system of imperialism. Um, which we're seeing the guts of it being peeled out, which has been really, it's going to be an interesting time. Thanks, Matthew. Do you want to say anything to that, uh, Ian? Just to reiterate that, that some of the most disgusting anti Semites are actually Zionists. Um, one only has to mention Major General Ord Wingate, for example. I mean, the um, the Urgun and the Haganah, and indeed the Stern Gang, the Lehi. Um, really uh, learned their trade in terms of driving out villages and destroying them um thanks to the british uh, uh the um uprising of of arabs who are being displaced i mean it has to be remembered that people being displaced for for, for a long time before um 1947 and 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 the uprising that took place in 1936 against uh, the, the the, the British support for, for the Zionist project, um, and it was an uprising against British rule. Uh, um, most Arabs were, were living pr pretty comfortably with, with Jewish neighbours, but it was the Arab uprising against British rule. And, and of course, then subsequently, uh, people who were trained by the British uh, formed the Haganah, and, and particularly under the leadership of, of, of Ord Wingate. Um, and and that was 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 subsequently you know the main force that was driving Palestinians from their homes, um, and of course uh, uh, the Jewish labour movement was originally called Paul Zion. It was the um, it was the, an affiliate of the Israeli Labour Party, uh, and it was at a time when you know if you I don't want to go into it, but if you mentioned black sections or anything like that in the nineteen eighties. Um, you'd be howled down, but Paul Zion had always uh, affiliated to the, to the Labour Party and it exerted an enormous influence, uh, especially on what laughingly passed for the left. Um, yeah, just that. Um, I was going to ask you both, um, maybe either of you knows it, um, you mentioned the, you know, Stalin supporting Israel and Ian, you outlined earlier, you thought it might have something to do, you might have thought that they would turn anti-imperialist or would turn against the West, etc. How did the um, Soviet Union, though, view the, the Nakba? Did they say anything on it? Did they criticise it, to your knowledge? I, I, I don't recall anything. Uh, I mean, what we see is actually the Israeli Communist Party uh, helped to organise uh, 
the shipment of, of weapons I into uh, Palestine uh, and and so, so Czechoslovakia after during the Nakba uh, was effectively supplying the weapons for for the Haganah. Um, and, and without that, it's arguable that they couldn't have, uh, have accomplished it. I think there was a, that I, without making a, a fuller study of it, I, I'm 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 speculating. Um, but the idea that there was a kind of uh, left Zionism uh, oh, okay. may have yeah. may, may have given uh, some kind of reason to believe that that, that that somehow it could be turned into an anti-imperialist colony, as it were. But uh, it, it must have been completely fatuous because most of the left Zionists um, were, were, were not left at all. I mean, Ben Gurion was was supposed to be a left Zionist, but I mean, he was in charge of the Haganah and, and directly responsible for the deaths of many tens of thousands. Yeah. Also, Stalin himself, of course, was, a, was an anti semite as we know, <laughs> and always there's been this this is this co this collaboration between the the, the, the anti semites and the Zionists. When I when I lived yeah. in Moscow, I, when I lived in Moscow, I remember having conversations with people who said, I, "I'm I'm not anti-Zionist. I'm anti-Jewish. I think they should all go and live in Israel." And yeah, of course, exactly. <laughs> there, there was that whole period, um, and I remember it very much in in the 1980s in in student union type politics, where you know the the the, the refuseniks uh, in in the Soviet Union were treated as absolute darlings uh, because you know. Israel wanted a, a, a good steady supply of very right-wing people who'd come out of the Soviet Union and hated anything to do with socialism. Uh, and uh, and whole, 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 whole for the, the, the part of the far right in Israel actually is is exactly that, you know, that, that ex-Russian. Ex um, yeah. Yep, yeah. thanks, thanks both. Um, Robert, please. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, go back to a point I think Comrade McFadden made uh, in the U.S. and uh, after the post-67 war, as Ian pointed out in Finkelstein stresses, Finkelstein, that that is really the beginning of, it's a historical beginning of really a full-throated um, uh identification of the U.S. and U.S. interests and the interests of U.S. Jews, supposedly, with, with the state of Israel. And uh, as, as Comrade McFadden pointed out, um, there was a weaponization, the weaponization of anti-Semitization, weaponizing anti-Semitism was first directed against the black movement at that time, as it began, SNCC, et cetera, began to identify with um, other movements of oppressed people, specifically uh, the Palestinians. Um, and against the left in general. And I remember it was around 1971 that um, Rabbi Meir Kahane, whom people may recognize as the founder of the Kach Hadi Leda, a fascist party uh, in Israel, a terrorist party. Um, and the JDL, uh, I remember specifically attacking um, protests against, say, Golda Meir, uh, visiting at Brandeis in late 1971, they were armed with chains and uh, karate weapons. And uh, the point being, though, that suddenly, oh, in this United Front that I was in, about 100 leftists was probably 50% Jews. Jewish leftists it tended to be very um, almost uh, you know, uh, dominant in the, in the left at that time. Um, and that uh, suddenly we were called anti-Semites, if not Nazis. And the most celebrated case that I'll just kind of end up with was uh, what the attacks on writers, um, particularly James Baldwin, in I think the 1980s uh, at the University of Massachusetts, when he was uh, severely attacked for his uh, support to the Palestinians, his anti-Zionism. And he was someone that used to be uh, routinely featured on US uh, mainstream talk shows on television before this period, suddenly he gets disappeared in the 80s. Um, Baldwin was one. Gore Vidal is later, uh, in the later 80s, uh, in the, in the uh, pages of Nation magazine, is attacked by the neocons, uh, Norman Pedoritz, etc. So the things that are going on today, the anti-Semitization that 
that you're facing, I know in particularly uh, nasty form in, in the UK, um, it, it resonates with me. I mean, very, very personally. Um, I'm someone that has, you know, as a, as a kid but in, a, in a Jewish neighborhood, I, uh, I supposedly have a tree in Israel. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was, as Ian has said, it was left wing in the post-war period up till probably 67 you know, it's left wing to be even talking about this stuff. Then we get Exodus and Moses and all that, you know, that whole genre that, that was talked about. Um, so I, I just wanted to, oh, I, just to add to Kahana, I think I mentioned that he emigrates to Israel, yes, and founds the Kak Party, which is extremely, you know, a, a biblical uh, return to the biblical Judea and Samaria, and it's Israel. And, uh, but my main point there is the, not just the exploitation of Jewish suffering, which Finkelstein highlights, but the instrumentalization of it against certain uh, certain uh, spaces or areas, particularly the black movement and uh, the left that at that time particularly, well, I remember uh, suddenly we, we were very, um, we were sponsoring speakers that were, um, from the Israeli socialist organization, and they were being attacked in these forums um, with this craziness that uh, Israel is the Viet Cong uh, of the Middle East, and uh, and uh, Peter Buch was one, and uh, you know that uh, that you know you people are are you know you're feeding anti-Semitism. So um, you know I just wanted to maybe leave it at that. Um, Thanks, Robert. No, it's, it's also interesting because, you know, we, we had a lot, obviously, had the, the Corbyn movement was taken down mainly by anti-Semitism. And a lot of people around the labor movement thought, well, this was just, you know, they're just doing it to get rid of Corbyn, which they also did to get rid of Corbyn. But of course, it much precedes this, you know, the, the, the weaponization of anti-Semitism has been used many, many times before it was a useful tool to, against Corbyn. But of course, it is mainly about stopping criticism of Israel and, you know, stopping anybody in their tracks by saying you're, you're an anti-Semite, you know, you, nothing should be taken seriously that you're saying. It's a, it's a very blunt tool, but it's been used since 1967. Well, and, uh, you know, increasingly so, it comes back and back. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Did you want to say anything on that, Ian? Just, just a couple of little things uh, about the whole question around freedom of speech. Um, I remember very you know, as clear as day uh, when um, there was a time when uh, in National Union of Student Politics, for example, no platform for racists and fascists was all the rage. Uh, and uh, lots of student unions, including my own, um, said we you know, took a platform of, of no platform for racists and fascists. And then I watched... Uh, uh, Effectively, uh, what what was then Sunderland the Polytechnic Students Union uh, disaffiliated its Jewish society on the grounds that they were racists because they were Zionists. And what then followed was a kind of series of heated debates, and from that moment onwards, I've never been able to tolerate the idea of no no platform. I, I think it's far better to ha have that debate uh, the idea, because of it, because we've seen the way in which it's been used against the left. Uh, you know, your your anti anti israel so therefore you're anti semitic so you may not speak at all we'll cancel your um you, we, you know we'll we'll cancel your 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 booking and this kind of thing and from that moment onwards i, I was never able to tolerate it uh, i remember a rabbi getting up, and, and one who struck me most of all the rabbi getting up and saying um israel uh, judaism has got as much to do with zionism as apartheid has to do with the united dutch reformed church it's it's a it's a it's a, a right-wing political, you know, Zionism is a right-wing nationalist movement. It's got nothing to do with Judaism. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so that was important. And one other tiny little footnote, of course, the, the McCarthyite period uh, meant that Britain gained lots of really good left-wing writers, just as an, just an aside, writers and actors and all sorts who, uh, who, who couldn't get employed in the United States came, came to Britain. Mm. Um, John, please. Uh, thanks, Tina. Um, yeah, uh, two quick points. Uh, the, f the first is that uh, when I first came into anti-fascist politics, when I moved to Manchester in 1974, um, 
there were a lot of quite elderly by then or late middle-aged um, Jewish comrades who had uh, been in Ajax after the Second World War, and they um, had had fought in the streets of North Manchester in Cheatham Hill uh, against uh, Mosleyites who were still around then. And of course, we, we know about Cable Street uh, before the war, and uh, th there were similar confrontations in Manchester and Leeds and various other cities. And that has ebbed away. That generation died off in the 70s and the, and the 80s. And when I look at demonstrations, Palestinian demonstrations now, and look, look at the uh, Jewish Voice for Labour contingent, who are very visible, uh, they're either my age uh, or older than me. And in the meantime, the Jewish left, which used to be so strong in the diaspora generally, and certainly in this country, um, has disappeared. And that's created, I believe, the, the political space for Zionism to move forward onto the offensive. Uh, without knowing that they will be opposed by large sections of the Jewish community, uh, that they, they do not have that fear anymore. And the the um, that allowed um, the Zionism and the Holocaust industry to move forward. They got this international human rights definition through um, uh, and they really made the most of it. I mean, the, the, the very little that I know about where that definition came from is that there were a lot of Zionist academics who got together uh, about 10 years ago and uh, started uh, basically campaigning for it and it went through and it's that definition which has enabled the weaponization of anti-Semitism in, in a way that I think, although I accept that what people are saying that it, it had been around for some time, I think that it's, it's actually moved through the gears uh, because of that international human rights definition and is, and is now able to score political victories of all sorts of types, including keeping the um, the South Africa's uh, hearing at The Hague today to fourth place uh, in the BBC Evening News tonight. Um, it, it, it came behind uh, Fashion Week, for instance, um, which tells you... It, you know that that I think that that it, the situation has changed, and it's changed because of the absence of a of a large multi generational Jewish left, which is partly the problem of the British left, um, and partly the problem of a generation dying off and not being properly replaced. And that's partly to do with gentrification as well. But the the, um, the important point I, I, I'm trying to make through all of this is that um, the weaponization of anti-Semitism has never known such an open field as it's got now. And it's it's able to score major victories and have major influence over political parties and major mainstream media outlets as well. Thank you, John. And major vic victims. I mean, Norman Finkelstein is one of the victims. People are losing their jobs, etc. Yeah. for sure. Um, Tony, you wanted to come back in uh, again. So let's have that. And then uh, I'll bring you back in, Ian. All right. Yes. Hello. Uh uh, I'm sorry I missed some of the discussion, uh, but uh, I am back. I, I, oh, God. Hold on. Someone is ringing me. But I will... Let me just turn it off for the moment. Uh, 
I was quite interested in the reception for the Holocaust industry because when it came out, uh, sorry, I'm just telling the person who rang me. Uh, when it came out, of course, it it met with a storm of protest. Uh, and I think Jonathan Friedland's, uh, uh, the Guardian Zionist gatekeeper, summed it up the feeling best when he wrote that uh, the Holocaust industry was closer to the people, and Finkelstein himself was closer to the people who created the Holocaust than to those who suffered it. Uh, but it wasn't just Finkelstein. The SWP, of course, were also not very happy because for the SWP, anti-Semitism is an eternal and unchanging phenomenon. I mean, uh, they really do consider it uh, to be something which is as ever-present as it was in the 30s in many ways in Britain. Uh, and I, I just quote from... Uh, it was a review article by their chief theoretician, Finkelstein in the Holocaust, which is, you can find it quite easily uh, on the internet. Kalinikos said, Finkelstein has come under vicious attack. Jonathan Friedman wrote in The Guardian what, what I've just quoted. Uh, but then he goes on to say, so exaggerated is his, Finkelstein's polemic, that at times he comes, quite contrary to his own intentions, dangerously close to giving comfort to those who dream of new holocausts. And he says, how is it, how different is his assertion that the field of holocaust studies is replete with nonsense, if not plain fraud, from the holocaust revisionist David Irving's rantings during his recent libel case. So the SWP, which of course has extremely simplistic politics on most things, is unable to see, for instance, how the history of the Holocaust has been fashioned in a particular uh, manner. For example, I mean, uh, I've written about it, it's in my book. Uh, some of the major Jewish Holocaust heroes, like Marek Edelman, who led the Warsaw Ghetto Resistance, or, or Rudolf Verber, uh, who was uh, the first of the Jewish escapees from Auschwitz, who escaped to warn Hungarian jury of what lay in store for them, and whose report, the Verba Wetzel Report, or the Auschwitz Protocols, as it's better known, was suppressed by uh, Rudolf Kastner, the leader of Hungarian uh, Zionism and the representative in Hungary of the Jewish agency. Uh, none of this uh, percolates through. Uh, to the SWP. They, they don't understand, you know, how uh, literally uh, uh, people have been uh, erased from the memory. I mean, and yet Zionist historians themselves have covered these topics. I mean, I quote extensively from a, a two-volume book by Shabtai Betsavi, who's a right-wing Zionist, uh, and, ha and he went through how the memoirs and the writings of the Zionist Holocaust heroes who fought in the Warsaw Ghetto have been changed almost out of recognition. People like Haj Klinger, for example, uh, who, whose uh, memoirs, diary, was almost unrecognisable. But it, he went through uh, one after the other to show how they've been tampered with in order to fit into the Zionist narrative, which in essence is that uh, the Zionists led the Jewish resistance uh, to the Nazis, whereas the truth, of course, is that two-thirds of the Yiddenrat, the Jewish councils, uh, were collaborators. And Hannah Aron wrote about this uh, in Eichmann in Jerusalem. It was the first uh, major book. I mean, it sold I mean, in its hundreds of thousands, but the Zionists were aghast that when she wrote about the Eichmann trial, she wrote about all the things that they had wanted her not to mention. Uh, and there were a number, for example, the the name of uh, Konrad Adenauer, the German chancellor, was not allowed to be mentioned uh, in the trial because of the relationship with Germany. The fact that Adenauer had as his closest advisor, Hans Globke, who was instrumental in the uh, writing of the... Uh, Nuremberg laws 
and who as a jurist gave the severest possible interpretation uh, to uh, the Nuremberg laws. For instance, not only was sexual relations with an Aryan uh, uh, forbidden a capital offence in Germany itself, but he also uh, interpreted the law as applying on an extraterritorial basis. That is, a Jew who has re such relations with an Aryan outside of Germany would still be guilty of the offence if they uh, were in were located inside Germany. So, uh, the the SWP for the SWP, any attempt to look at these things is, is anathema because they have a very simplistic analysis. They don't, they don't really see how anti-Semitism has been weaponized and fashioned in a weapon for uh, those uh, who defend what Israel is doing. Uh, I did actually raise our Trades Council last night as to whether uh, Stand Up to Races would be marching with uh, Zionists uh, in uh, Glasgow this year as well. And I, I got the impression that uh, I think they finally got the message, but uh, we shall wait and see. But uh, clearly it would be an outrage if they did. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Do you want to reply to any of this, uh, Ian? Just to add these US origins of miscegenation laws. Yes, um, absolutely, yeah, yes. You know, so, you know... Um, <laughs> the, the, the Nazis didn't invent them. Uh, they, they took them uh, lock, stock, and barrel. And of course, uh, Henry Ford's support for, for Nazism, he had a very nice medal for, for, with a very nice swastika on it for <laughs> helping to establish uh, motor plants in, in Nazi Germany. Well, Jew, Jews, the American Jew, Jews, including the Jewish establishment, uh, launched a boycott uh, of Henry Ford and his cars, and he was forced to close down, I think it's called the Dearborn Independent, which had been printing the protocols of the elders of Zion and various other anti-Semitic nonsense. Uh, boycotts were all in fashion when it, it suited them, but of course today anyone who mentions the word boycott is by definition anti-Semitic. Uh, but there you go, that's how Zionism was fashioned uh, the narrative and the discourse. Uh, and it's really up to us to challenge that narrative, really, because it's a very poisonous uh, narrative and it's a narrative that has consequences as well in terms of human beings and uh, their lives. It's not without cost. Thank you, Tony. Um, the last person um, who's got a hand up is Anthony. And then um, bring back Ian to sum up I think I saw what uh, what um, was his name Matthew said uh, that you have to see the crimes of Zionism and then the Holocaust is in and fascism. It's kind of the deep crisis of capitalism, which is in its worst crisis today. I mean, it, the Slater was bad in its early days of capitalism, but as Mandel said, in the decaying generation of capitalism, all the worst features come out and rocks, and it's coming out again. Uh, and fa fascism is a major problem. I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, the thing that's undermining the world is, and the fascists over there is the pro-Palestinian movement. But uh, we have, we have. To, I think the what well, the Holocaust is used for pillars purposes for the Zionists, but also it's important that not just against the Jews, but against Jewish for working in the middle class, the gays, uh, and all the other oppression works. I bring back that memory, which I think is in, is important to uh, important to do. Uh, there's also a split in the ruling class, and the American elections and the British elections are going to be forced on fascism versus bourgeois democracy. I wouldn't vote Democrat or bourgeois party in America, but Labour could go on that big theme. Uh, and they might go slightly more social democratic, and they could be the biggest landslide ever. I mean, they're talking about the Tories being down to 100, Reform UK are dangerous. There's a thing on politics, there's a left shift as well. They're overplaying the fascists on politics, lives on the dangers of the fascists. Uh, it's one thing, I'll two other points and I'll come out. It's one thing to um, um, to adapt to the Zionists and the United Front, but the anti fascist group, we have to unite with all kinds of people, but we don't compromise our politics and policy, and that would be extreme opportunism, but we can't be ultra left after. And the single issue is Zionism, Palestine, and the anti fascist group. A link, but there have to be separate alliances and separate united fronts on that. But it's interesting what Robert Montgomery was saying. I don't know if it's known over here, but Chap Barnes is absolute hairy carry. 
It's one like the trap, and I support the Vietnam War. He's opposed to a ceasefire in the American militant. I wonder if he knows cause my father uh, was around, went to the American SWP convention, Pat Brady, in 1957. He knew Peter Buck, and they're having the whole debate when they read, when they were trying to say, What plate haven't they had the whole debate all night in, the, in these flats? I think that's the early 60s. Uh, I wonder I wonder if he was from the Robert Montgomery was from the American Soldiers Workers by tradition, knowing Peter Buck, because they played a big role against Zionism. But now Trump wings took over the group, probably doing an entry to destroy the organization. I don't think they'll be swabbling to it for him. I wonder if some of the old Trotskys are coming back. Of course, they're aging and dying, so when we come back, the good youth radicalization is giving a new lease on life to people. But we need the old cater for the continuity and their experiences to have because they're very knowledgeable and experienced people. I'll leave it there. Thanks, uh, comrade. Um, Ian, uh, would you like to reply to anything and perhaps sum up this session then? Thank you. Uh, the first thing is just to simply say, don't waste your time with the BBC. Watch Al Jazeera, which is giving by far and away the best coverage of what's going on in terms of what, not only what's happening in Gaza, but in terms of... Um, the, the, the actions of the South African government in 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 the, the Court of Human Rights. Um, the other thing is about fascism, and of course this crops up time and time and again. Um, I take fascism to mean what happened in the 1930s, not because uh, it was just then, it's just that the importance of that concatenation of events where you had the potential for a proletariat that could take power and a bourgeoisie that was prepared to support any bunch of thugs that would prevent that possibility um and that from that point of view just simply saying that something is right-wing nationalist and authoritarian and therefore it's fascist I, th I think is a bit of a mistake um yes it's right-wing yes it's nationalist yes it's 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 brutal um, Zionism, but I, I, that doesn't make it fascism of itself, um, you know. And and I think it's important to to draw that distinction. It's not just an epithet; it it, it has consequences to to chuck this stuff about. Um, but you know, it's very hard to argue that there is a a, 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 a more odious government in the world uh, than Israel at the moment, and uh, our first action is to oppose it here <clears throat> whether it's a direct action as as uh, as, uh, as as palestine action has done or or through the palestine solidarity uh, movement generally uh, but our actions have to be against also the british government the, the likelihood is uh, the, the, the the Tories will lose the next election and there will be a labor government no one's actually going to be voting labor because of they're massively impressed with Keir Starmer and Keir Starmer will have to go uh, into an election saying why he thought that the uh, genocide being perpetrated against the people of Gaza was something that he thought was a legitimate expression of, of international law. Um, so the, the importance here is we need the enemy is at home um, and we need to fight those and uh, by all means necessary. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, Tony wants to come back in, so I'll um, break our usual uh, routine and break, bring him back in. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on what Ian said about the Israeli regime uh, not being a fascist uh, regime. I mean, I, I, I agree with him. Uh, although there are self-declared fascists within uh, that coalition, without a doubt, Miri Regev, uh, ben Gavir, Smotrich, uh, and, and others as well. But uh, I agree it isn't. It's Fascism is a different political animal, although it, it often has much in common with what is a settler colonial state. I mean, that's not to say, therefore, that Israel is better. Uh, indeed, I mean, you could argue that settler colonial regimes are one stage worse than fascism, uh, America never experienced a fascist regime, but they exterminated the bulk of the Indian population. The same in Australia, uh, the same in the Belgian Congo. So, uh, I mean, settler colonialism is not better, but the difference, of course, is in settler colonialism, the settlers form their own society. 
in which there's a class alliance between the working class uh, and the ruling class uh, at the expense of the indigenous population, whereas fascism is predicated on the destruction of the organizations of the working class. That is not the case in Israel. Uh, no one has suggested that uh, the histadrut uh, be wiped out. On the contrary, it, 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 it's part of the criminal conspiracy against the Palestinians. So it's important. I mean, people do call Israel fascist uh, more as a term of abuse rather than as a term of analysis and understanding. So that's all. It's a very important clarification because if we if we don't have that weapon of fascism, you know, understanding what it actually is, we won't recognize when it comes back and when it does try to do um, destroy the working class. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Ian. Brilliant uh, presentation. Very good discussion as well from the floor. Thank you very much. We're going to see Tony again next week. Also, uh, comrade Tom Suarez. We'll be talking about Zionism during and after the uh, Holocaust in, in Israel. And that'd be a very interesting uh, discussion, no doubt. Thank you, comrades. Um, and um, hope to see many on your, of you on Saturday at the demonstration in London or wherever you are uh, out there will we'll be um, demonstrating against what's going on. Thank you very much, comrades. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.